There we go. And I'm going to start with a brief um, opening and welcome to everybody who's joining us and to everybody who will be watching or listening to this uh, shortly. Thank you for joining the Career Conversations Books Club second. And I realize I still have the date from the first one on this slide. So my apologies, but the second um, book club. And I am so delighted to be joined uh, today by Norm Bacall. And Norm, we're going to call you Norm, not Norman, but uh, it's up to you if you're okay with that. That works. That norm, works. Norm it is. And a uh, couple of points that I wanted to go through here just so that everybody is aware. So first of all, if you want to post anything, I've got a hashtag and I'll put that into the chat. GA Career Conversations. Please feel free to do that. The format for tonight, if it's your first time joining us, um, we are together for about 90 minutes and the 90 minutes will be spaced out roughly one third where we're going to learn roughly from a third from Norm about his career journey and hear from him. The second part will be me asking him some specific questions about the book. And the third part, we want you to participate. So we're hoping that you'll get some questions ready for us to, um, to have Norm uh, answer about the book or about his career, whatever it is that you want to ask him about. Out. Uh, I am going to ask if you could keep your phone, your mics muted at least until that last part. But if you have questions, put them into the chat, and I'll come to them as soon as I as I can when we get to that stage. We are recording this session just so that you know, and it'll be shared with the registrants. And for anybody who's here as an Ontario lawyer, this does qualify for 90 minutes of CPD for professionalism through the Law Society of Ontario. And lastly, just because we're going to be here together for a little bit of time, um, what I wanted to remind everybody was I used to say at, at different gatherings that I want to create a safe space. And the work of Elise uh, Ahakora really came to my mind uh, recently, was brought to my attention. And she talks about brave spaces being exhausting for some people and and really uh, putting some pressure on individuals uh, to to have to have those brave spaces so I've converted the the conversation to be more of one of an accountable space one that we each take responsibility for what we're saying what we're thinking come with good intentions and the understanding that we're aligning our intention with the action um, and commitment to uh, to being able to um, have open conversations with everybody. So I'm really excited about the conversation. We're going to get started. What I'd like to see in the chat, and because you mentioned it uh, earlier, uh, Norm, Lauren, I think you are our winner by by far in terms of the farthest, but if people in the chat could just indicate where they are, they are joining us from. Is it from Toronto? Is it from somewhere else outside of Toronto? Is it from outside of Canada? Uh, because I think we have a few people from different places, so we'd love to see that in the chat in terms of where you're joining us from. And we're going to get started. Norm, part of the reason that I had wanted to, hello from Georgetown, Leslie. Um, <laughs> Part of the reason I had wanted to do these uh, these career conversations is because many people, myself included, are always craving, are often craving, finding out from uh, from different people where they. Um, how they came up with their journey, how they are uh, moving forward in their careers, what they, why they chose one path over another, how they started, how they pivoted. And so you've had an incredible career story. I've sent your bio to people separately, and we want to hear it from you. But in terms of the story that you've had from your early days in Montreal at a small firm, then moving into um, a particular part, a type of legal practice to managing a, a leading Canadian national law firm and now to this chapter where you are writing and a speak uh, writing and speaking quite uh, quite a bit you've got your own TED talk which you might uh, tell us about can you share with us briefly your personal highlights of the career journey how and why you started each of the roles and how you decided and when you decided to move on and thanks for for joining us from New Brunswick I see somebody but uh, yes, so let's start us off Norm <laughs> Uh, first of all, uh, thanks for having me, Gina, and welcome uh, to all of you. It's really my honor to be here uh, in front of you tonight. Uh, it's funny, I used to lecture on campus uh, in, in the olden days pre-COVID, and, and now I do it by Zoom, but my lecture always started the same way, and it was, I used to be you, uh, so how did I get to be me? And when I say I used to be you, I mean it. I was the student with the long hair, the scraggly beard, the green knapsack on his back, uh, who I'm not going to go back so far to uh, 
to, to the beginning of time. If, if you want that, you can you can find it in my TED talk. But uh, when I when I graduated law school, actually, when I went for interviews at the end of second year law school, nobody hired me. Uh, when I went for articling interviews in Toronto, at that point, I went to school in Montreal. I was planning to work uh, in Toronto. Uh, I went for 12 interviews. I got 11 rejections. Uh, and, and I was a pretty good student. So my marks were there, but there was obviously something missing. Um, and uh, frankly, I just didn't interview all that well. So I, uh, I put that away, walked around, walked around with a small chip on my shoulder. Uh, particularly when I finally arrived back in Toronto so many years later. And the, even the firm that hired me, it was a small Montreal firm called Heen and Blakey, when I applied there on my own as a student, rejected me. And it took a friend of mine who was actually working there who told them, you should hire this guy. Uh, when I applied, in fact, I was at that point planning to move to Toronto. So it was a bit of happenstance that kept me in Montreal uh, for an additional nine years. Mm -hmm. And who knows where I'd be today if I had taken the one job offer I had in Toronto. Uh, ironically, that firm no longer exists either. Mm -hmm. So uh, so I joined this small Montreal firm. As it turned out, it was the perfect place for me, although it was a bit intimidating because the two names on the door, Peter Blakey and Don Johnson. Well, Peter was a Rhodes Scholar and he was the president of the Federal Conservative Party. Whereas, and Don Johnson was the gold medalist in his McGill class. And he, by the time I uh, had joined the firm, he had been appointed uh, to the federal cabinet. So these were some really uh, very nice people, but very impressive people. And who was I? And I think in, uh, in one word, I think the answer was I was nobody when I started. Uh, not terribly impressive, hired because I happened to know somebody. And I started in my first four years, uh, I don't, I think my 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 boss's review at the end of my fourth year was, Norm, there's something missing. I don't know what it is, and I can't tell you. So imagine that kind of review uh, at a firm, and I can't tell you how depressed I was, but I went home, and my wife, who's always been my, my biggest fan and greatest supporter, uh, gave me a good talking to for a number of hours, and ultimately... Uh, the, the long and the short of it was she said, Norm, you're missing initiative. Like you're letting your career happen to you. You're waiting for the work to come in the door. You're not taking charge. Mm -hmm. And by the time she was finished with me, I, I went back to work the next day angry. And in some respects, I'd say that that review that night changed my life. And, you know, flash forward all those years later when I sat down to write Take Charge, and I'll, I'll connect the dots afterwards. It was with that in mind that I wrote it. It was for all those students and young professionals and young entrepreneurs who just, they're scratching their head because there's, there's nobody out there telling you how to do it. If you're lucky, you'll, you'll get a good mentor along the way. If you're lucky. And if you're not, you know, you're left, you left your own, to your own devices. So... Uh, but that changed me. And from that point on, I decided every meeting I went into, I'd be in the lead. I wasn't going to sit back and just take orders. I was going to start thinking one step, two steps ahead of every client who I met with. And slowly but surely, I began to change. I wasn't someone who was comfortable in social situations. I was the guy that if, if you were sitting next to me at the wedding, uh, after about five minutes, you turn to the person on the other side. And you know that person. Well, that used to be me. So I learned some tricks along the way. What were they? Well, I wrote them all down. I put them in the book. But the one thing that uh, nobody tells you is once you begin the process of personal change, you start evolving into something else. You start becoming uh, a person you can't imagine when you start. So that's why it, it was, it's funny for me when I hear about people say, this is what I want to do when I grow up, or I have the, this, this vision of, uh, of where I'm going to be in the company uh, 10 years from now. I kind of laugh to myself because uh, it's not so much a ladder as it is, as, as I put it in my TED talk, it's more of a river. My career has really been that. I've done all, all kinds of things I never could have imagined. 
So yes, when I was in second year law school, I knew I desperately wanted to be a tax lawyer, even though I had no idea what tax lawyers did. I love tax. So, you know, that was at least point number one. But, you know, did I want to litigate tax? Did I want to work on transactions? I didn't even know what any of that meant at the time. And what happened was as, as you go along, as you experiment, you find out some things you're better at than others. Some things, some, some things you just need to develop a skill. I mean, the one thing I discovered was it doesn't matter how smart you are if you can't communicate. Doesn't matter what a nice person you are if the person sitting next to you at the table doesn't want to talk to you because they think you're boring or they just don't want to be caught with long pregnant pauses. So I started to develop skills. I started learning tricks. My wife, who is probably the best interviewee I've ever met in my life, she went out, she went to 11 interviews and I think she got 12 offers. That's how good she was. So she, at one point, she told me what she did. She, you know, then the answer was simple. She said, when you're stuck with somebody, start interviewing them. Pretend you're the interviewer on, on, uh, on Pulse News. Just keep asking them questions. And every time they give you an answer, ask them another question that leads from it. Because apart from anything else, it shows you're listening to them. And, uh, and th there's one thing I learned from all that. And that is uh, that if you do that, uh, they may come away from the evening knowing absolutely nothing about you. But what they are going to say is you're one of the most interesting people they've ever met. And why? Because you showed interest to the star of their life. And who's everybody's star, whether they admit it or not? It's not, it's not the actor on, on the film, it's themselves. Like we're all the stars of our own little personal stories. And if somebody's taking the time to really find out about you, it shows they care. So it was little things like that that went from what I'd call tricks, which I don't think is a fair word, but it's the one I'm going to use for the moment. But it went from there to becoming second nature. And slowly, slowly, I was evolving. I was changing. I mean, the notion that, uh, that I'd be able to get up and give a TED Talk, if you'd asked me when I was 25 years old, I would have said, forget it. Uh, if you'd asked me, whether I thought in my career I'd be representing all kinds of Canadian film and television studios, I would have laughed. Or that Donald Sutherland, even as a second or third year lawyer, would be my client and would, would treat me with a respect that I frankly hadn't earned yet. And that's, that's something I put away in my pocket. Donald Sutherland taught me about, hum, about humility. I love that, that it doesn't matter how famous you are. That if, uh, if you've drawn the second year lawyer in the firm and you treat that person as if he's the partner on the file, that person will bend over backwards and kill themselves for you, which is, of course, what I did. And, and I promised myself when I grew up, one day when I got old, uh, I would pay all those lessons forward. That all those pieces, little pieces of information and tidbits I picked up along the way, all the helpful hints, all the... So, you know, you know, when you just tilt your shoulders in a different direction, suddenly you see the whole the world in an entirely different perspective. That's 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 what was happening to me. So in 1989, uh, we took the plunge. I just decided it was uh, probably something that had been brewing inside of me. But I made the decision to move to Toronto. I walked into Peter Blakey's office and Peter Blakey is a very imposing man. And I walked in, I said, if the firm wants to open a Toronto office, I'm ready to do it. Hmm. Now, is that a conversation I could have had with him even two years before? Not a chance, but I was ready and he knew it. And he said, well, it's up to the partners. We'll have a partners meeting. And we were a small partnership. I had just become a partner at the beginning of that year. So I'd been a partner for 12 months. I'd seen the partnership. Uh, you put a bunch of lawyers together in a room and you'll get consensus on exactly nothing. <laughs> well, this was the first unanimous decision in the history of the firm. I was going to Toronto. We were going to open an office and play it by ear. So, uh, so we, lo we loaded up the truck. Uh, Sharon had just had our fourth child literally 10 days before. And uh, we drove down in a caravan of two cars because she was nursing uh, to Toronto and set up shop. And uh, what we didn't realize it was the first day of the recession in 1989. 
uh, but no no matter would we have decided it if we someone had said the recession is coming the recession is coming well, i don't know i was going anyway. And uh, did I know how to run a firm? No. Did I know how to run an office? Not a clue. I didn't know what I was doing. And I just figured this is going to be the great social experiment of my life. Imagine, and and I have a young face, but imagine you're 33 years old. Uh, you look like you're in your early 20s still. And you're walking into a meeting with 50 and 60 year old, olds and saying, listen, how would you like to join my my firm? We are going to be the next great name in Toronto law. And uh, I go back to my office, have a good chuckle after that, and wonder whether any of them were buying it. And every so often, and what I noticed was uh, I would get two reactions. Um, one was fear. I could tell they were more afraid of this meeting than I was. Like they were actually afraid they may not be able to succeed if they left their big firm. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there were the others who, when I said to them, Here's what I'm offering you. I'm offering you the opportunity. When you, when you left law school, you had this ideal of what the practice of law was going to be. So if you join me, I will make that happen for you. That's my guarantee. It's the only guarantee I'm going to make. We're going to have fun and you're going to be so happy. It's going to be unbelievable. And uh, every so often, somebody actually bought that. And then you know the, the, nec the next part was, how do you make good on that? And that's which you have to learn the hard way by making lots and lots and lots of mistakes. I mean, the other key, the other key phrase that I learned over, over the years, which wasn't an easy one was I'm sorry. Uh, you know, as a leader, uh, and I was developing my leadership skills kind of as I went along. And sometimes I was, I was dead on. Right. And sometimes it was frustrating because when you're growing a business, I don't know if any of you are, have your own businesses yet but when you're growing a business nothing ever goes according to plan nothing ever goes according to scale mm -hmm. and regardless of whether you apply the same rationale and approach to your decisions sometimes those decisions will be the greatest things you've ever decided and sometimes they'll be crashing failures so one of the lessons i learned over time was that uh, it isn't about whether you're right or you're wrong it's about how quickly you admit to and deal with your mistakes. Yeah. And if you don't let them linger and destroy what you've built, then you have an opportunity to, to keep growing and people will forgive you the mistakes. Not too many though, when you're in a leadership position. But I can tell you when I was practicing law, I kind of, I began to love what I was doing. I was working with film studios in Canada. Eventually I started working with film studios uh, in California. I couldn't believe it. You know, my partners were going to Sudbury to do labor arbitrations, and I was getting on a plane going down to Burbank and meeting with uh, film executives at at MGM and at Sony Pictures and at Warner Brothers. And it was it was it was not only cool, but it was really warm in the winter. So it was not, just a nice place to go. And over over the years, I developed some really good friendships and got to meet some unbelievable people. Um, uh, you know, I'd go to the commissary on the studio lot and there'd be some actors sitting at the table next door and you weren't allowed to talk to them, but you could say you saw them to your friends. <laughs> and uh, one day, I, in fact, one day I was walking on Rodeo Drive and I, uh, I passed Rick Moranis. And as I was passing him, I looked at him, he looked at me, he said, Norm? And uh, that never happened. <laughs> I was going to say, wait a minute, how did you know him <laughs> at that point? <laughs> uh, but uh, it's a good story. It was, it was, it's the same as my red story, car, uh, red carpet story. Eventually, I made it onto the board of Lionsgate. So that was my, my crowning moment was uh, sitting in the boardroom when we made the decision to, uh, to produce The Hunger Games. And nobody was sure whether that you know, how well the film was, was going to do. Like they, they were pretty conservative when we, we first looked at it, but I remember going out for the premiere and there was Jennifer Lawrence on the red carpet, standing shoulder to shoulder with me. And that was, that was cool. Even though like she had no idea who I was. So guess what? I was nobody. <laughs> so that's why it doesn't, doesn't matter, uh, you know, who, you know, what you do, how you grow uh, to somebody in the world, you're still going to be nobody. 
Uh, so what's what's really important, um, and I'll probably shut up and, and let you ask me another question now because I've, I've covered a lot of this. Um, but what's really important, um, and I've just cut cut myself off, is having uh, a really good feeling about who you are mm. and what you're becoming. Which and and I would say that's way more important with who you know and what your list is of uh, of people who you've met in your life. Ultimately, the person who you really need to get most comfortable with if you want to succeed is yourself. You know, that's so important um, on, on a number of levels. Um, getting comfortable with who we are, uh, you know, getting comfortable with either being that person at the wedding that um, doesn't talk a lot and then deciding to make a difference uh, moving forward or getting familiar with that person who doesn't talk a lot and finding other ways to to make your mark. I think it's really important to to keep that in mind. Uh, being comfortable with yourself and getting to know and like yourself is really important. I've I've asked a question in the chat, Norm, as you were describing. I'm, I'm looking at the answers here. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it covers such a wide range. And I think I think your book never stopped, whether you're, you know, I think the young or the, the newest is four years, although you've said in Canada, so I, I know there's a career before that. So five and a half years to 24 or or more years, I think we're never stopping to, to learn about how to uh, move forward. Um, one of the things that I want to ask you about before we go on into the specifics of the book is in terms of advice, you've just described a pattern of um, career circumstances that I think some of it was planned and strategic about but other things may have happened by happenstance some of the things that you discussed were sort of a little bit serendipitous now i know that you and i have talked about this a little bit in terms of when we're talking about career advice for people um yes of course you need to strategize and plan and as you just said sort of take charge about some things but then sometimes there's also opportunities that come up that you have to be ready to take as well the my favorite word and i i always thank um, the late Peter Hogg, who was dean at Osgood and a professor at Osgood, who used that phrase serendipity in one's career and being open to it. I wonder if you can sort of let us know, has your has your career journey been more planned and strategic or more serendipitous or a combination of the two? It's a combination of the two, but I'd say more serendipitous than planned. Mm. So for, you know, I'll, I'll give you just a few examples. Uh, when uh, when Peter Blakey was the managing partner, and when my pre predecessor Jean Potvin was the managing partner of the firm, uh, I used I had a joke with Jean. I'd walk into his office, and uh, whenever I'd see him, uh, because I'd be visiting him out of town, and I'd say, "Jean, you're doing a fantastic job," uh, because I knew there were moments where he was extremely frustrated, and I thought the worst thing that could happen to all of us was that for him to quit, because this is a job I will never take. I will, I will never be the managing partner of a law firm. <laughs> it's, uh, apart from anything else, I don't think I could ever succeed at it. But uh, when he discovered he had terminal cancer, uh, there wasn't a choice. And they came to me and they said, would you do it? And I said, well, I, I will share the job as an experiment. And so I took it on a, on an interim basis. But again, we were at that point 165 lawyers, probably a total headcount of over 300. I, I didn't know how to manage an organization outside. Yes, yes, I was building an office, but I had the best of all worlds. I, uh, I had lots of authority and no responsibility. There was somebody else who was the boss. Uh, I wasn't. And I could always hide behind that when, uh, when, I, when I had to do something I didn't want to do. Uh, you know, I, I could blame him for, for taking the decision. Suddenly, here I was in this role that I hadn't trained for, I didn't want, I wasn't sure I'd be any good at, but I said, yes, anyway. Why, you know, from a serendipity perspective, it's sort of, I've, I've taken the, you know, the, the life view that when the opportunity presents itself, you say yes. And the worst that'll happen is you'll fall flat on your face. And it, in fact, it isn't the worst that'll happen. I discovered that through experience, I discovered it's actually the best thing that can happen to you is you fall, fall flat on your face uh, so that you can pick yourself up learn the next lesson and keep going a little bit wiser, a little bit better, more experienced. And you discover you didn't break. Like the fall didn't break you. You, you went on. You, whatever, whatever it is, whatever that terrible thing is you have to live through, you live through it, you move forward, you keep going. 
I mean, those are those are lessons I can talk about. But unless any of you have actually lived through them, it's you know, it's it's just words. But think- that that's that that's an important part of uh, of moving forward, and you know, the serendipitous approach to life. I, I you know, I I I really don't think. Uh, you can plan it certainly in building an organization. As I said, I took over an organization of 165 lawyers when I retired from the leadership position. Um, we were close to four, four times that amount, and you know we were generating five times the revenues. So it was, you know, could I have could I have taken that monster on with no experience? The answer is of course not. But it grew, I grew, we grew together. Uh, we learned from one another. No, I think that's a, a really important comment to make. And I love the the fact that you say, you know, it's not the worst that can happen if you fall and and uh, um, and hurt yourself and, and make mistakes. That's actually not a bad thing to actually come back from. Um, I, I want to move into the book, Norm. And one of the things that I want to acknowledge when I see people's answers in terms of how, how many years they've been sort of post-graduation in the in the professional world, I know that we have people on online who aren't lawyers necessarily, and, and people who either in the legal profession or in other industries and professions that have come to Canada with a life and sometimes professional world outside of Canada. And I think I just want to acknowledge that 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 move itself going from one place of life and work to another is both a combination of serendipity and a combination of uh, of, of planning, but also tremendous strength. So I just want to acknowledge that all of you who have lived in different places and have made Canada now or another place, Lauren, you're in, in uh, San Francisco, I don't know if you're working there or living there. Um, that takes tremendous courage and determination as well. So kudos to all of you. Um, Norm, you talked about your wife giving you the title, the words take charge, you've got to take charge. And that's the, the, um, the series that you, you know, the label of the series that you had. This is the first book in this series uh, that I read two summers ago, I think. Um, but this book, the, the Never Stop, the third one, um, tell me your why. Tell us a little bit about the why you had to do this book. Why was this book important for you to write, research, and share with uh, with others? Well, first, I didn't give myself a choice. I, in it, I Take Charge, if you read it to the end, what you'll see is I talk about my next book, Triple Triple F. Yep. Uh, I, because I knew if unless unless I put it in there, I, w- I wasn't going to do it. I'd come up with excuses not to do it. Mm-hmm. But if I if I made the commitment, I would. And the reason I kept going was because um, Take Charge was designed uh, as a primer for. It, it came out of all my university lectures. It was I used to be you. How did I get to be me? What are, what are the next five things you need to do, or the, what are the ten things you need to know to get from university to on the road to a successful career that nobody's teaching. And what I found was I'd written a chapter uh, I, that um, when, I, when I finished the writing, it was called Masterclass on Marketing. And I looked at it at the end and I was discussing it with my editor and we concluded that I was stretching the book too far. And by stretching the book too far, I meant I was taking it, you know, I re- really I thought it was from graduation to five years in whatever it is you're doing. It wasn't just for professionals. It could be anything you're taking on. And I concluded what I was talking about now was six years and more, and maybe this would be a good anchor point uh, for for another book. So I committed myself to write it by giving it a title, Triple F. Uh, if you look at the mountain uh, on uh, on Take Charge very carefully, you'll see what Triple F stands for, but I'm not going to repeat it. Yeah. Are you talking uh, on Never Stop, right? On Never Stop, yes. Yeah. You'll see, it. Yeah, You'll see the triple F. I got it. it onto the cover. <laughs> I saw that. And uh, for those of you who look at it, there's there's a word that uh, I was uh, impressed that you actually put it on the cover with a little uh, asterisk. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's something about embracing fear in a different language. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Some, <laughs> I think- somebody finally said, Norm, that's not your brand. So... <laughs> So I, I, I played around with some other titles and never never stop is what I came came up with. But th- that was the beginning point. And then, you know, that the one thing that I find so rich about LinkedIn is the opportunity to continually meet new people. Mm-hmm. 
And so what I what I did in the course of writing Take Charge was I interviewed a whole bunch of people, some of whom I knew, some of some of whom uh, I had met along the way. And the things they told me about themselves were I found were remarkable. It was an, it, it was uh, in some respects a bit of a turning point for me because what I was looking to discover was are you know my theories about uh, career development uh, are they just mine? Are they shared by other people? And does it make a difference how you started? So for me, it was a uh, you know middle class middle class suburban uh, background for me, but. Did it make a difference if you got off the boat from Jamaica when you were 16 years old with only the shirt on your back and you grew up in the toughest neighborhood in Toronto? Did it make a difference uh, if you were an Asian immigrant? And it did it make a difference uh, uh, if you were a woman as compared to a man? And I wanted to explore all these things. And the way to do it was to talk to all these people uh, in a completely uncontrolled environment. So it was just sort of a, you have an interesting background, I'm going to talk to you. And I thought it, and the reason, one of the reasons I did it, and I'm going to bend just a little bit so you can see, but when I wrote Breakdown, which was my career memoir of uh, success and failure, uh, it was all first person, it was all Norm's story. And I figured if, when, I, when I was started to write Take Charge, I figured, you know what, I think people are getting tired of me. Let's, let's take a look at other people's stories. And so I did the same for Never Stop. And I, I wasn't quite sure what subjects I was going to discuss. I just kept finding these fascinating people online. You know, one was a, a, a very successful a criminal lawyer. So if you've read, who, who, who was it that said they're only on page 47? <laughs> you've, already, you've already read the story of a very highly successful criminal lawyer who was a drug addict at the age of 13, was thrown out of her house, had to survive on the streets of Toronto, uh, regardless of the season. And she still managed to pull herself out. And I thought when I, I almost cried when I listened to her story, but I knew she had to be in the book. I, I wasn't quite sure where it was all going to fit. And, and I kept interviewing these people. And I could, uh, one was a, a practitioner in Vancouver, a family lawyer in Vancouver, who's uh, gotten incredible traction uh, and has become sort of a, one, of the, one of the leading voices on work conditions for uh, for lawyers uh, on LinkedIn. And she has a vision of what she wants to achieve in, in her life. And 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 speaking to her, I, I remember, I, I literally, I reached out to her completely blind uh, on LinkedIn, which is what I do now, which is, I, I think you're very interesting. Would you like to talk? And uh, I, I have no idea why she responded because she didn't do any research into me. She just actually set up a call. And after we had the call, uh, she had her oh my god moment a little bit later. She said, "I had no idea who you were when I, when I was talking to you." But I thought, oh, if you want to interview me for a book, it sounds interesting. <laughs> um, so, so what I did was I did the interviews first, and then I again I tried to find okay, what are the what are the threads, the commonality? Yes, I had my I had my subject on marketing. I put together something else on digital marketing, but uh, but the main themes w which are. Uh, how do you overcome your fear and your anxieties? And how do you get out of difficult places in your life and turn it around? You know, those are the stories that really, A, fascinated me and I thought would really fascinate readers. So yes, it's a short book. It's meant to teach particular skills, but I think way more important than the skills you might learn from reading this book uh, are the stories of the people uh, and how there are so many different ways to come at success. And I think, you know, that that leads to, to my next question, because um, the stories really were helpful and powerful, because as you said, it's your information, your suggestions, your theory, but it's um, um, exemplified by different voices and different experiences. And the one, you know, you had a really powerful start to the book, um, apart from the title and the the title and the uh, the mountain, as you said, uh, your comment is that um, a simple sentence that says it's the voice telling you that now is not the right time. And I, I saw that I just I resonate because I don't know how many times I've heard in my own voice, not yet, not now, it's not the right time. You're not ready. And then with that simple, straightforward answer, screw all that negativity is what you said, and and the right time never appears. How true is this for you and for those that you've spoken to? And how do you get past the negativity of yourself 
and of the others that are around that are saying, not yet, not now, not the right time. That's powerful uh, uh, information. We, I think we need to understand, not all of us, but uh, those of us who are not on the far extreme of risk taking uh, need to acknowledge that we, generally speaking, will come up with excuses not to do what we need to do when we need to do it. And my start question, again, this is mo more from hindsight than anything else, uh, are, I, I think you have to start by asking yourself the first key question, and, and that is, do I fit where I am? Hmm. And it, it could be your work environment. Uh, it could be your friends. But you, you have to, you know, if, if you want to move forward, you, you, you eventually need to confront the hard question as to do I fit with these people and if you don't fit you're going to walk around with anywhere from low level to high level anxiety uh, you're going to walk around feeling uh, if not like a complete failure like there's something wrong with me and the one, the one thing we have to confront, and this is, it started in, in Take Charge, and it's, it's certainly uh, magnified in Never Stop, is you have to confront the fact that the thing that's holding you back isn't, I need to think about it more, it's, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. And and the little voice at the back, sometimes there's a little voice in the back of your head saying, I'm not happy, I need to do something about this. But there's the, the other voice in your head saying, you might fail mm -hmm. or you have a, a family member or a good friend and i'll put friend in quotation marks who said do you really think you should be doing this now mm -hmm. are you prepared to risk your family your family's you know, economic success over this and you say you know what I'll, I'll just put up with it for another six months i'll just put up with it for another year i have an abusive boss but I'll, you know i'll just outlast her and when you hear it coming out of my mouth, it's really easy to nod your head and say, yeah, can't let that happen. But when you're in the situation, it's really hard to self-evaluate. And, and it's funny because I learned probably more uh, in learning to write fiction. You will see in, in, in Ophelia and Odell Stoll on the right um, about those kind of issues than, uh, than in any of the nonfictions I've written. And I say that because, because the one thing I've learned about fiction writing, I'm, I mean, it, it, it's interesting. I, I, you know, we, we talked about the success end of my career, but what we didn't talk about, which you know, I spend one third of breakdown talking about, is my entire business life collapsed underneath me uh, when I was when I was 57 years old, and I was left with uh, in a huge financial hole, a firm that no longer existed, uh, and uh, what do I do with the rest of my life? Moment. And I hadn't figured that out. So I started writing for catharsis and the writing evolved and evolved and evolved. And it was my wife, once again, who came to me after uh, while we were editing Breakdown and said, you know, you can write. Why do you know, have you thought of writing fiction? Well, what I didn't know was fiction is it's like becoming a tax lawyer. You may say you want to be a tax lawyer, but you got 100 things you got to learn before you're going to be any good at it. And it's going to take you five years before you become the least bit competent. And most people will say, particularly when they're in their late 50s, five years at this age, are you nuts? Mm -hmm. And what I said was, and this is what gives me the legitimacy to go on a university campus and say, I used to be you. How did I get to be me? And I'm going through exactly what you're going through right now. I have that doubt. I don't know whether I'm going to be any good as a writer. I don't know whether my books are going to be well received. I have no idea about social media. I have no idea how I'm going to market. I have no idea about all these things about a whole new career I'm taking on from scratch. And I'm now 66. And now I can say I've been at it for nine years. And I've done my 10 or 20,000 hours. And now I have an understanding of what I'm doing. But what I see, what makes great fiction is that when is that when you're the reader, you're watching these characters and all you're saying is, no, don't do that. Mm -hmm. You're making a huge mistake or well, you just make up your mind and do something about it unless instead of perpetuating this horrible relationship you are, you're in. 
that's what a great that's what a great writer does he engages in this conversation with your brain and what we don't realize as readers is that we're really good at assessing the characters on the page or the characters in the movies even if they're terrible movies we know what they should be doing we're watching as outside advisors and but we never ask ourselves well you know am i am i making those same screw ups myself like what should i be doing i'm i know what they need to be doing and why can't you apply that to yourself so um so i mean so one of the reasons you know that 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 i that i pushed ahead with never stop is uh, my goal is to shake you up a bit and just say there's never a right moment stop labeling yourself and I, and I came to that in the final draft literally those those thoughts I had the book was finished I and I do my I think I do my best writing when the book is finished and I go back and and I just I say I'm going to read it one more time and I say oh yeah that I haven't said this yet or maybe this maybe the most important point in the book uh and I'm about to finish uh I'm only making now and thank goodness I didn't rush to publish it and you know we're it's interesting because one of the things that I often share with others is that um that fear that stops us from making a change is is where we're also going to learn from it's a place of learning that that discomfort that fear of changing is somewhere where we will learn as you said you know you um didn't know anything about marketing or didn't know as much about marketing, about social media. We'll come to that in a, in a minute. Um, but those those are all the reasons why you can't. And we sometimes forget about the reasons why we can or we can move forward and should move forward. But one of the things that you've talked about is that in the first book, yeah, what you originally had a couple of chapters on the relationships and about networking and how you sort of needed to put that into um, this other book that you've created. So never stop. Uh, in any organization or, or profession, whether it's law or other service industry where we have relationships, those are really important. Professional relationships are important to our success and to the success that our organizations might have. But sometimes we resist focusing on this, on relationship building or on marketing. People hate it. I put it in air quotes for, for folks. But you devote two chapters to business development, getting new clients, keeping the ones you have. And I think it's sort of divided in that area. What are some of your key lessons about whether you call it marketing or whether you call it about client development or whether you call it relationships? Because that's what ultimately it is. What are the key takeaways that you offer through your book uh, on that topic? Uh, let me get a piece of paper. <laughs> all right. I, I'm going to hold it up. I, hopefully you can see it. But I, we all have this idea of networking, that it, it's, yeah. it's like a tree with branches and you branch off and you branch off. I don't believe in that. I believe in this. I'm just about right, now here, here it goes. Can, you can see oh, it. you can't see it with the virtual background. Oh, no. Sorry. Let's see. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll make it really simple, though. Okay. It, it's a wheel with spokes. Yeah. Imagine a wheel and it's got spokes on, on it. And really good networking involves constantly remembering that you are the center of all the spokes. Mm -hmm. And your job is to connect the different spokes together. So you'll, you'll, you're, you're doing your, your best value for people when you're figuring out this person's never met that person. I think I'm going to put them together. Now, what a lot of people do is they put them together and they get out of the way. And if you really want to market well, you should be doing just the opposite. You, you need to stay in the middle of that relationship. In, and you need to nurture it not as a two-way relationship but as a three-way relationship that's probably the, the simplest thing that i try to teach like never get out of the way never go from a to b to c try and make it a and b and c and see how the three of you and then the four of you can add value to one another because the one thing from a business perspective that makes you valuable isn't what's in here. It's not what's in your head. It's not how smart you are. I've, I've seen some pretty average, intelligent professionals whose clients think they're the greatest thing that's, that's ever been invented. And why? Because the key is to show you care. And the best way you can show people that you care is to look for opportunities, not for yourself, but for them. 
and then follow up with them and follow up with them and follow up with them. And the network, keep, and the, what happens is you, you keep adding spokes and it gets more and more networky and suddenly connections begin to exist where you never could have imagined them. And that's what business is. It's not just following one lead to the next. It's keeping all the leads knowing that you are the center of their success. No, and how does that apply? Um, we can see it if you're if you've got a bottom line, if you're part of the responsibility of a bottom line. So if you're a uh, an associate or a partner or in a service industry where you need to make those connections for the purpose of your own bottom line. But does it apply equally if you're an employee or if you are not, you know, I, I oftentimes get people saying, I want to leave law because I don't want to have to worry about networking or I want a job that I don't have to think about networking. And I've got a takeaway from that and, and a response, but I wonder if you do. Um, is networking something that only those who are worried about the bottom line have to think about, or is it also um, something that each of us in our various I'd, roles? I'd say I'd say it's up to you, but uh, the reality is, and, and you're talking to somebody who uh, my mother can tell you, and she's on. Uh, you know, I, I was pretty shy and laid back as a as a kid. And I said, as I said, I you know wasn't the person you wanted to be sitting beside. I wasn't the person you'd normally engage in conversation with. When I, you know, I, I I used to have this habit. When I finished saying what I had to say, I just shut up, which makes people crazy. And I've used that to negotiation advantage, largely because I learned strategically. Most people are driven insane by silence, <laughs> and if you can just sit there quietly after you've made your point, they will eventually do something stupid. Uh, largely because they'll do anything to avoid the silence, which people find very uncomfortable. But that's, that's another story that I'm getting myself carried away. But, um, but I think ultimately it always comes down to whatever we're not doing, we're not doing because we're uncomfortable doing it. And we think we're not going to be any good at it, or we think we're going to fail at it. Or, you know, how many people won't do something because uh, they're embarrassed about what someone else may think. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how, how often does that hold you back? And it's, it, but it's what you need to, to get past it. You know, I, I write in, it never stop that, you know, that the biggest problem that uh, professionals and entrepreneurs have is the assumption that, you know, if I, I pick up the phone and call you and reach out to you, um, that we're going to start a relationship and I'm going to be successful. Uh, whereas, you know, there's empirical proof in the management schools that it takes a minimum of seven encounters with someone mm -hmm. before they'll trust you enough to send you business mm -hmm. or to start, you know, big, or to start the beginning of a serious relationship. I can't tell you how many situations I was in where, and again, going back to when I was at a junior employee with no practice of my own. And, and ultimately it's about who are you going to meet? Not because you, you want to, you're going to get out of anything out of them today, but because seven years from now, they're, they may be somebody senior somewhere. And, and you know what they're going to think? You know, when I was a nobody, Norm really looked out for me. Like people remember that. And again, this is something Pick, I picked up in fiction, and it, I call like, and I put in the book. It's sort of the, the Luke Skywalker and the Yoda. You know, the 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 star of the movie, uh, isn't who you want to be. In the world, what you want to be is Yoda. Yeah. You want to be the person that every every member of that audience loves. Yoda, walks away loving Yoda. Oh my God, Yoda's so selfless. The Yoda's helping Luke. There's nothing in this for Yoda other than you know, than, than helping the hero of this movie. And you may, over the course of a number of movie, a, 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 a number of films, uh, have moments where you like Luke, you love Luke, you hate Luke, but you always love Yoda. And, you, and Luke will always love Yoda. Sorry, I mean, you say in the book, you're not the hero, and you emphasize that, right? Um, apart from the seven points of contact minimum that you say, that phrase about not being the hero um, really, really resonates, right? And that's something that you've discovered. And uh, did it come through from the interviews that you had as well in terms of not being the hero, letting others be the hero? 
uh, without anybody actually saying it. Yeah. But I, when I look at, you know, some of the greatest rainmakers I've ever met, and I, you know, rainmakers being someone who just have this natural inclination for generating business. I, I've watched them. Like they sit down, they'll sit down with a stranger and they'll start interviewing them. Mm-hmm. And, and they'll lean in and they'll look deeply into their eyes and you know, tell me about you. What's your story? And they just listen and re- respond and ask questions. And you, I, I, and I watched somebody do that at, at, a, at a session uh, at, out in the West End last year. Uh, someone who's, who calls himself a self-proclaimed extrovert who gets, mm-hmm. who gets his power from, uh, from being with other people. I just, I watched him in action and I said, you know what? I'm still not there. I, I got to work harder at it. And I learned some lessons just watching him sit at a table with a group of strangers who within 10 minutes, he owned all of us. It, it's interesting you say watching because I'm, I'm reading some of the messages that have come through on the chat and, you know, from the um, uh, the sense of it being intimidated, intimidating, possibly the sense of it um, being something that is learned over time. And thanks to both Ivana and to Leslie for commenting that, you know, it's hard stuff to do initially, but then you you keep practicing at it. And as you said, Norm, you're looking at somebody and you just keep learning from them. But I want to pick up on what Lauren says as well in terms of networking feeling exhausting lately. And I think to your point, um, you know, Norm, you've just said, look somebody in the eyes and and ask them, um, you know, on a deeper level. And and that comes out with what you've asked there, Lauren. Um, Yeah, I think the answer, Lauren, I think to to answer you, Lauren, directly, it's to stop worrying about what you're going to share or what you're going to say next. And just listen to them and say, okay, what's my next question? Yeah. And that becomes pretty easy. And 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 because once people, once, once whoever you're sitting with sees that you care about them, it's like it's I talk about the the art of the free phone call in terms of marketing. As I, I encourage clients and prospective clients to call me for as little as no reason at all. And I told them, listen, it's always going to be free. So like I don't want you to ever hesitate to pick up the phone and call me. I want you to call me and, and maybe we'll spend 30 minutes just talking about your family because that's what's bothering you that day. And I don't want you for a moment thinking about, oh, Norm's wasting his time or Norm, uh, maybe, maybe he's going to bill me for this call, you know, for the three minutes of business advice and 27 minutes of social. Mm-hmm. No, I want, I'd rather spend half an hour talking to you about you and your life because when you get off the phone, the, all I want from you is to think, wow, I never any, met anybody like that before. No, I think that that's really important. And I'm mindful of the time. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and get people to, to think about the questions that they all have sort of just uh, in a few minutes. But um, two questions that I want to ask you, Norm, uh, Leslie's mentioned social media. When you started um, in in your legal career, there was little social media you've really embraced it you talk about LinkedIn (laughs) right now you've really embraced it and I know that some people are still leery or afraid of it or or maybe not sure that they're doing it okay but what are some of the key ahas that you've had in embracing social media and using social media um LinkedIn became my uh I'll call it my drug of choice Mm -hmm. Uh, and I've tried others I, I tried Twitter I decided fairly early on there was just too much anger out there and I thought and and I found actually when I spent half an hour on Twitter I found myself getting angry yeah. about things I was reading and I said this isn't healthy I'm not doing it That's my choice uh you know I've, I've tried Facebook I find it a little bit too socially for me uh LinkedIn feels good I got into it fairly early although I have to say the they keep changing the algorithms That's frustrating. You, you think you have a successful formula and then six months later, it's not working for you anymore. And when I finally decided that my goal wasn't, uh, to, wasn't about how many followers I had, but it was uh, how deep my connections were, when I, could reach out, uh, when I could reach out to somebody like Lauren and just have a chat mm-hmm. out of complete nowhere, or uh, Nick and Ado, am I pronouncing your name right? 
The cane. Okay. Oh, sorry. Wow. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. That's way easier. <laughs> but when I, you know, when, when we, we can start having a conversation and, and here are two people that, you know, six months ago, I'd never heard of, and they'd never heard of me. Um, that's when I realized that's what I'm in it for. And then that's when the surprises start happening. Mm -hmm. when, when, when the connections start to multiply. So, you know, so I've got 26,000 followers who cares what matters is uh, I post regularly. Uh, I try and stick to my message every so often I'll uh, go off script because something tickles my fancy and it's, it's good. It's a good practice. And I'll bump into people on the street who I don't, you know, who I don't even know from LinkedIn. He'll say, Oh yeah, I, 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 I watch your posts. Mm -hmm. I like reading them. So, uh, you know, if you have something interesting to, to say, if you have something you've learned that you want to share, it's, to me, that's what it's about. But I say that, and and the reason I'm going to give you courage is because I'm deathly afraid of TikTok. Uh, so I, I have enrolled in a TikTok class, and I am undertaking that 12 months from now, uh, I am going to be saying, I did it. I did <laughs> it, and I, I don't have no idea what the measure of success is, but I am starting TikTok like, it, it, probably in the next week or so. I'm, I, I've signed up. I'm getting involved. I am going to do it. And that's, you know, if I have to, if somebody asks, what's the secret of your success? The answer is I look at something, I decide I'm going to do it. And then I do it. I'm gonna and it's talking. never going to work out the way I think it's going to work out. And I accept that, but it's always going to be better. I love it. Um, uh, yeah, TikTok is one area that I haven't uh, pursued. And I, and there's just so much in terms of so many opportunities or options in terms of social media that it's like, okay, not one more platform. And I, I really do um, uh, appreciate Sandra's comment that, you know, some people think that it, LinkedIn is like Facebook for professionals haven't really bought into it. And I love the fact that you use the phrase bought into it, Sandra, um, or leaned or learned to leverage it. And I think I'm I'm a big uh, supporter of, of LinkedIn. I do think it's a really great place for exchanging uh, professional information and supporting each other. And that's where, Anne, I'm going to uh, make your comment as well. Sometimes I find it is hard. And, and Norm, you know, you talked about going deep with people to uh, to develop that 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 relationship and that uh, that sense of caring. And it could very well be a gender challenge sometimes to have those deep conversations. Um, you know, the last session that we did, the last book club, we talked about how women can can um, network differently, for example. But what it, what if you're the person that you want to network with is, um, you know, a male in a very male dominated industry, thinking about how to approach that, I think is really important. And starting off on social media in a safe forum, if you will, um, is a is a part, but then how to take it to that next level, you know, Norm, for you calling people up and or and inviting them just for a, a chat, I think is a really good uh, comment. But between Anne's comment about um, the challenges between sometimes the gender divide of, of networking and Sandra's hesitance about LinkedIn, any comments on that before we go to the last question, before I open it up for questions? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll throw out a, just a couple of ideas because there's no, you know, there's, there's no universal, uh, trick that's going to work in every situation, but there are some things you can do that will sometimes work as long as you're prepared to accept that sometimes they're not going to work. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing I learned was I used to think that, it, you know, if I did people favors, they, they were more likely to like me. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what, and, and it was a piece of advice I actually took from Ben Franklin, uh, who said, no, just do, do exactly the opposite. If you want someone to like you, or if you want to start a relationship with them, ask them if they'll do you a favor, mm -hmm. because if they say yes, then something in the back of their heads has to convince them you must be a nice person because otherwise, why would they be doing you this favor? And that is what you need at the core of starting up a, a, a valuable relationship. So it may be counterintuitive uh, if you're a woman to approach a man and, and say, listen, uh, I really need a little bit of mentoring. I'm not asking for a lot of your time, but you know, would you just give me some advice and help point me in the right direction? Uh, you, you'll, you'll probably find, you, you may get a few people who will blow you off, but it only takes one person who would say, yeah, I'll do that. 
to start you on, a, on an entire direction you can't imagine where it's going to lead you to. Um, Ignacio, and I'm not sure if I'm saying it correctly, so please correct me if I'm, I'm saying it incorrectly. Ignacio, his comment at the very end, uh, I think it's the ask that scares most people, and you referenced that. That's the part that we can't be afraid of that we have to get to do you want to comment on that norm because you referenced that in your book in particular you've got yeah. to be asked well you know what <laughs> lawyers are the worst and and you know what i and I, I have clients and other contacts calling me all the time and they laugh they they said he you know the, the, this the, the man or woman came right up to to the line but they won't ask they just they just won't ask the question okay will you send me the work or will you try me out like they're they take it right to the edge um, and, and the same applies uh, to your social media. Um, you, if you're, if you're going to be successful, you, you know, you need to finish with an ask. There needs to be a, okay, what's the next thing you've got to do? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's, you know, like the post, maybe it's share the post, maybe it's, uh, just leave a comment below. That's an ask. And that's, you know, that's, you know, leave a comment below if you have something to say. Uh, when it comes to you know service provider providing or goods, you make your pitch. Um, you know my view on that is you pretty much have five minutes uh, tops to make your sale. The rest is uh, you know all kinds of other exchanges back and forth. But ultimately, when you sit down with somebody new, you've got you've got less than five minutes to impress them. Especially these days, it's, it may be as little as one minute. You need you need to know have your 60 second, I call it the elevator speech, cold. Mm -hmm. So that if you're thrust into that situation where you gotta make a good impression, you have one minute, you're riding up that elevator from the ground floor to the 28th, that's it. By the time they get off at 28th, that was your one opportunity to impress the former prime minister of Canada, that's it. What are you gonna say? And you need to have that, that speech canned, you need to know it inside out, it needs to be who you are and what makes you special. You need to know it. You need to work on it. You need to practice it. Do it on your phones. Record it over and over and over again. The more you say it, the better you're going to get at it. And ultimately, uh, from a marketing perspective, from a client perspective, it always has to finish with, and here's, here's, here's what I need from you, or here's what I'd like you to do, or here's why you're going to benefit from doing this. And Norm, you you were really um, you underscored. It may only be a sixty second pitch, but it takes a lot of time to practice it beforehand, to think about it, to reflect on it, to come up with what that is, so that it could and to and to practice on your phone. I love that you said that because when you have those sixty seconds, that's going to be the sort of the, the the moment that you have. It's got to be um prefaced by all sorts of planning and thinking beforehand it can't just be on the spot not for most of us for most of us we can't just be on the spot right mm -hmm. yeah and I, and I work with professional firms now I'll, mm -hmm. you know and and sometimes they'll hire me to come in and just listen to the pitch we're about to we have to go pitch a client tomorrow uh, here it is okay who are you meeting with fine thank you uh and I'll listen to the pitch and I'll say okay it, take out your first 14 slides and throw them in the garbage mm -hmm. No, nobody wants to know what they already know. And how many times, how many slide decks do you see with people giving like 12 pages of here's all the background and the back, and you're speaking to people who know it. Like, why are you doing that? When you walk into a room, you have one minute to tell somebody something they don't know. So they look at you differently yeah. or, or to show them something they do know, but show it to them in a way they've never thought of it. And now you own them. That's it, you've done, you've, you've, you've made your sale. But if, if all you're gonna do, if, you, if in the first 10 minutes, all you're gonna do is tell somebody something they already know, you know, you're wasting everybody's time. And, you know, I, I, used, I used to leave, uh, uh, when, I had to, when I was called into meetings like this, I'd leave a note with my assistant, you were to call me 10 minutes into this meeting. Uh, within it, you know, with the, that I have an emergency, I have to go see because I, I didn't want to sit through these meetings. And every CEO does that. Mm -hmm. Like they get, they get pulled out. Why? Because they told their assistant, pull me out after 10 minutes. <laughs> and because I can always say, uh, no, tell them I'll call them later because I finally met somebody who's telling me something I don't know. And that's important.
it's like the friend calling you uh, on a bad date or a potential bad date. But uh, exactly, think- <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, LinkedIn. I just want to make a shout out to Sandra because uh, Sandra Becker, who's on, um, has uh, had done a session with a colleague whose name right now escapes me, Sandra. So my apologies uh, on LinkedIn and how, you know, liking alone isn't enough to engage, but actual more engagement by commenting and, and continuing the discussion is really important on LinkedIn. I think when we're thinking about social media, especially LinkedIn, that was sort of a quick summary, Sandra, of some of the things that, that were talked about uh, during that, that one hour. Um, but I'm going to open it up to, I've got a couple more questions, but I want to open it up to others. We have about uh, 20 or so minutes. Um, questions for Norm about his career or about uh, Never Stop um, or other questions that people want to ask. And please, there's a little uh, where is it on the apps? I think there's a little hand button. Just uh, put the hand up uh, and uh, we could take the questions from there. I'm going to see until people have, until we come forward. Sandra, where did you go? You just moved on my screen. Yes. That's right, mine too. <laughs> I had to find you. Over to you first. Yes, Sandra. Hi, everyone. And thanks for the shout out, Gina. This is really a nice, uh, a nice evening. Thank you, Norm. Um, so I was just wondering, this doesn't come up in the book directly. It's, I guess, sort of a little bit coming up right now. Norm, do you have any advice for anybody who's facing resistance to diversity? You know, this is a very big and important theme that law firms are struggling with these days. And some firms, they sort of, you know, give it lip service. <laughs> and, and some firms think they're doing it, but they're not really going as far as they, you know, they could. And I think a lot of firms don't really understand the value to them to, to embracing diversity. Have you come across this in a way that you think you've seen anything that might be a successful it, suggestion? It, it, it kind of rem- it reminds me, and, and I'm going to go like completely out to left field, but then I'll come back quickly. Uh, I, I was at a, I spoke at a tech conference a few, just before the pandemic. And th- these are all tech entrepreneurs who are trying to sell uh, products to the legal industry. And I said, okay, so let me tell you, let me tell you what, what happens at your meetings. You go in, you meet with the director of technology, you have this great meeting, you get all excited. Uh, you have five meetings and it never goes anywhere. So I pretty much have it. And they said, yes. I said, well, the one thing you need to understand, particularly about lawyers, is they don't like change. Okay, we're, we're, we're a very resistant bunch. We're very conservative. Many, many lawyers became lawyers because they don't like making decisions, business decisions. They're, they're quite happy pointing out you can do this or you can do that and you, you decide, but they don't decide. So imagine that you're, you know, you're upper end of the firm with maybe one or two exceptions in the whole firm who are the people who actually can make decisions uh, are like that. And, and the, the answer when you apply it back to diversity is yes, intellectually, we understand we need to do it. Uh, we understand that in order to recruit the top people, we need to say we have this diversity program and that diversity program. And we even have a person who's responsible for diversity at the firm. Uh, uh, and once that's done, the leaders of the firm who are generally speaking in their fifties and sixties and didn't grow up with this, uh, didn't get it in school or coming to it late. No. Okay. We've got to be able to check, you know, they look at it as we need to check the diversity box, but they don't actually understand what it means. Um, they're way ahead of, you know, where, you know, where all the firms were 25 years uh, ago. But uh, they're they're roughly speaking, otherwise ten years behind. And we'll always and I think you just need to accept accept most of the firms are going to remain ten years behind. And the only thing that will change them uh, are their key clients coming in and basically calling their bluffs. So if the if if you know if your if your big client is the Royal Bank or the Bank of Commerce, and they are a multiple seven figure client. And they say, we've seen what you're doing and it's not good enough. And if you don't, if if you don't change, we're leaving. We're going to the firm we find that does this. That is when you'll see change. 
And, and I'm sad to say that is the only thing that is going to drive the change. Mm -hmm. Because generally speaking, law firms don't like to change. So yeah, they'll, they'll do all these things, but they, in some respects, they don't really understand what it means. They still understand client pressures are, you know, you've, you've, you've got to work X number of hours. Uh, it, what I found interesting was, obviously, the American firms were going through this so much earlier than we, than we were. And their big complaint is, we've gone out, we've, we've put such an emphasis on diversity, uh, we really have gone overboard in terms of, uh, in, you know, in their country, it was women and African Americans, and we put them in key positions and advanced their, their careers. And then the first thing they do is leave because the, all our clients are making them better offers. So like we're making all this and they get, they become a little cynical. Mm -hmm. We're making all this investment because we have to for our clients and our clients are the ones who are benefiting. We're not. So it's frustrating, but I, I but I don't, I, I see it's going to be very slow change. Hopefully we keep at it though. Yeah, slow, but uh, better to have than not to have. You know that you've got your uh, hand up. So let's go over to you first. And thanks for joining us today. Everyone. Thanks, Norm. This has been very helpful. Uh, I really liked the book and especially one of the examples that stuck with me was uh, the interaction with the, I think it was the US firm, you trying to go there to see how you can work better together and then the cut to the chase asking you to be, to give them more work. So I think I'm a junior lawyer in Canada. So I'm trying to, I like net, networking. I like interacting with people. I like it so much that I, don't really, I, I speak with people all the time and they don't even, they don't really know what I do. So I'm on so many associations and after like two years, they're like, oh, so you're a lawyer and you do this. So pitching is not really the first thing I uh, comes uh, natural to me, but I don't know if this is because uh, we're not taught how to advertise our services. And basically my answer would be, what's a better way to approach networking in a way where we have closing in the back of, my, of our head, our head. Like you, you want people to think of you for specific services without coming across as very aggressive. Where, yeah, where, where you network and how much time you, you spend as opposed to how much time you waste networking are kind of important, particularly when, time's, when, when your time is limited. So I think my advice would be is uh, figure out as soon as you can what interests you. Uh, make that your niche and then push your push your whether well, push your networking in that direction don't go broad don't go broad you know for some lawyers i saying why are you going to events with with lawyers <laughs> your time's so limited why are you networking with unless you get your business from lawyers why are you wasting precious time you could be with your friends or your family being at lawyer events you know the, be, be a lot more judicious about what you choose in terms of networking, but I'd say target your networking towards your interests. Don't go broad, narrow it as much as you can. And once you find that niche that interests you, then don't just show up at the networking events. You know, join the executive of the association, volunteer to do things. You know, the, 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 the nice thing about volunteers is you will rise in that organization much faster. And within a year, everybody will know who you are, which is the reason you're doing this. But the other reason you're doing it is because you want to be networking with people who are going to send you the work that you like to do and that you're becoming good at. So it, I, I think the networking needs to be coordinated as part of a broader strategy for how you're going to niche yourself. Thank you. And, and, and it takes time, right? Um, I think part of what I heard in your question, Yanni, though maybe, and maybe I misheard it, is um, I want to be able to make that pitch and, and get that work today, <laughs> tomorrow. I want them to know about it. And sometimes, Norm, let me know what your experience is and uh, of others. These may be relationships that don't come in with the job request right away, but it might happen. No, it'll, take, it'll take years, but you know, publish, whether it's on LinkedIn or publish articles or volunteer to write something for the association so that over the, you know, two years from now, you'll be regarded as the expert at this. And it doesn't matter how narrow this is, but if a bunch of people start to recognize you as the expert in that, 
And the wonderful thing about the world we're living in is that the pace of change is so rapid that you can become the expert at this uh, faster than I can. Yeah. Like they don't care whether you've been practicing three years or 30 years, if you're the expert at this and they need to know what's the answer to this. And that's how you build it. Lauren, you've got your hand up. Let's go to, the, to you. Hi. So I'm just curious, what's your favorite question to ask people when networking? Like your icebreaker, if you have a question, that's your go-to. Um, sometimes I'll go to a networking event uh, with only one target in mind. Like I rarely go to a networking event to go meet 20 people. When I go to a networking event, there's, there's usually just one or two people in that entire room that I want to meet. Everybody else I'm wasting my time with. So the, this whole, you're going to start a social discussion with a complete stranger and turn that into something five years from now. I can tell you that's a good strategy, but I think it's a terrible strategy. <laughs> okay, because that never worked for me. But... I go to I, I go to a, an event and maybe there's only one person I, I want to meet that night. And so, so I go to it strategically. So I won't say I won't, you know, I won't walk up to people cold. And, you know, you can when you've been practicing for 10 or 15 years, when you have a reputation and you know people actually want to meet you. But when you're nobody, I, you know, I was, you know, that at that stage of my career, I was the person on the fringes. I was shy, I didn't know what to do. It, it, I was completely wasting my time at all these events. But what you want to do is you, you pick somebody who, just one person. If you meet one person in that room on a night and have a meaningful conversation with them, you've won. You're, you've, you've succeeded way beyond your wildest dreams. So the other thing I'd say is way easier to network in teams. So two of you, two on one is way easier than, than one on one. And if and if the person who's who's uh, your wing person has any relationship with that person, there's your opener. Because you can't brag about yourself, <laughs> but your friend can say, you know, I want you to meet Lauren. Lauren is an expert at X. You really should be meeting her and talking to her about it. You've got your opening. So I'm a big believer in network, you know, network and teams and that. And then, you know, you do it for each other. You, because you can say things about the other person that you can't say about yourself. Thank you. That's super helpful. So have your wing person at the next event for sure. <laughs> Leslie, over to you. Hey, thanks, Gina. Um, so just quick, little quick background information. I'm a human resources professional. I'm not a lawyer, and just sort of fell into the professional resources space at McCarthy's. I started working in the student program, and then associate program and then education programming, and then it ultimately moved to Lensner Slat as director of professional resources. So now I'm in, just started my fifth year uh, as my own, in my own business, uh, and I'm in that human resources and professional resources space for small and medium-sized law firms predominantly. And two recurring issues that I see year in, year out, speaking to uh, junior lawyers and students at, at these law firms, the first one's taking ownership of their career and they don't seem to understand that that's what they need to be doing. They think the work's gonna to come to them. The partners will tell me what to do. They'll give me the work, I'll do it, I'll give it back. Um, and the reflex of that is the partners think, oh, she's happy to not be busy. Mm -hmm. She's not asking for work, right? Until I explain, you know, I speak to one side and talk to the other about what's actually happening. But I wondered, Norm, if you could speak about the other issue that I'm seeing recurring year in, year out, and that's uh, imposter syndrome. And these younger professionals not feeling, you know, that there's that self-doubt um, and not putting themselves out there because of that self-doubt. So I know, you know, the sort of tips and the things that I say to them. So I'm, I'm hoping maybe you could speak about that and um, give me some advice on that as to how I can handle that and help them along. Uh, it would, more than anything you can say is if somebody who they really respect talks about their personal experience with imposter syndrome mm -hmm. I, I think that will that would go a long way in yeah. fact i'm it's something i'm fond of talking about and i write it i wrote about it in uh, in breakdown like when i when i started uh, encountering success uh you know I, I was teetering on the edge of depression mm -hmm. because you're walking around thinking i'm you know i'm not nearly as good as people think i am 
And it's only a matter of time till the whole world figures it out. And, that, and that's basically it. And this was before anybody had defined it, before we knew what it was. Uh, it's always been there, you know. So, uh, so having a role model, I think, come in and talk about it uh, may be helpful. And I can't guarantee that it will, but I think people mostly just need to understand they're not alone. Right. In, in terms of imposter syndrome, in terms of the rest, it's, you know, whether, whether you can get, you know, whether, whether you can light the fire under someone, you know, if, if it's more than just imposter syndrome, if it's just, uh, I don't know where to start, it's too hard, I'm not going to try, mm -hmm. uh, that you can't teach, unfortunately. That's people, you, you, can, you can sometimes light the fire, but if, if there's no fuel in that tank, and, and I had lots of experience with those those juniors. They just didn't last long. Mm -hmm. They were they were kind of a cannon fodder to get us to till we found the you know the one in ten who had the fire burning. Mm -hmm. and so it's so it's a combination of two things. But I but I really think from an imposter syndrome perspective, having them hear from really successful people what their own struggles were has to be powerful. That's great. Thank you. And I'm happy to come and talk to them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Leslie, great. thanks for that. And, and I wonder, um, a comment that I'll make um, about what you just said, that sometimes the fire is not there. It, it goes back to something you had said earlier on or as well, um, I think, Norm, that, you know, are you in the right place? Is the fire maybe not there because you're not in the right place or not in the right role or not in the right environment? There might be something about that that is keeping the fire from from you know from from showing up or as you could say as you said it, it might just be that nobody's ever talked to them about it and and there's a mis misalignment or miscommunication so i think there's there is so much that um that might be happening and that conversation leslie the conversations that you're having is uh is so important uh, for sure so thank you for that um yeah. sorry Sorry, I was just going to say, and often um, the partners in the firms don't understand or they don't recognize that they're not giving the feedback yeah. that the young person needs. Mm -hmm. and they don't ever, have, most of them don't feedback. ever give, most of them don't ever give any feedback. Yeah. <laughs> That's where I come in. <laughs> and, and that, and the, you know, that that is so very true that uh, lawyers, especially, I think, are, they've not been on the receiving end of really good po proper get properly given feedback and really don't know how to give it necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think it's it's really a, a learning opportunity for a lot of people uh, as, as we move forward. So I'm yeah. glad the, to the, the other thing we've discovered from a, just from a, a criticism perspective is you know we, we are, the, the general assumption in the workforce is you've got to give a criticism in a sandwich. Mm. You know? two pieces of bread that are, you did this well, and with the criticism in between. And for lawyers in particular, the ratio needs to be four or five to one, mm -hmm. uh, or it won't be accepted, period. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. no, I'm a believer in, sorry, I'm a believer in here's what you're doing well, and here's what you're going to work on for the next year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with Oksana who says sandwich doesn't work because they're hearing, you know, they're they're missing the meat in the middle if it's uh, covered by by the bread around it. If we can use that analogy, um, thank you, Oksana, for that comment. Uh, and now, is it Nikkei? And we've seen you on LinkedIn. Nikkei. I love the post that you've been doing about the, from the Kindle uh, Kindle comments. Oh, and I love your guest with us. Please let me hear your name so we can say it correctly. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so it is Nikain. I'm sorry about earlier. No problem, Nikain. Well, yeah, great post. Who wanted to be with me tonight? Right. <laughs> Hi there. Hi. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so mine is more of um, a thank you rather than a question, um, because I love how Gina pointed out that uh, section where it said about waiting for the right time and how the right time never comes. Um, so an example of that is um, I've been on LinkedIn since probably 2012 and I've never made a post. I've reposted uh, like other posts. And I think uh, that post I made, Gina, that you're referring to with the Kino quotes, um, that was my first or second post. Wow. So um, as in respect to the right time never comes, 
Uh, if I were sitting waiting for the right time, that wouldn't appear, but you kind of have to make the right time for yourself. So it's just a matter of getting up and choosing that, you know, I was reading this book and it just seemed like the perfect um, opportunity. So not necessarily the right time, but an opportunity arises and you just make use of that opportunity. So for me, um, it was kind of an aha moment where um, I probably got many opportunities before, but I never really uh, took the steps to actually, uh, you know, make a post on, on LinkedIn. So uh, to hear uh, you commenting, Gina, about how nice it was and to see um, Norm actually commenting and engaging on that post, that was um, a really enlightening moment for me to realize that I took that step and it resonated with somebody. And also um, specifically relating to the post that the sections of the book that I made the Kindle post for, those definitely resonated with me where um, the first one was about uh, not being able to imagine yourself uh, in the future. And that's, that's kind of what, you know, that speaking of imposter syndrome, that's kind of what, uh, that means to me. So for somebody with imposter syndrome, it's simply that idea of not being able to envision yourself in a certain position or see yourself in the future. So um, take, putting yourself out there and just uh, come what may kind of thing. Just You just allow um, things to take its course, per, its course per se. And that's what I did with that post. And I'm just thankful to Norm for, you know, writing this book, providing us with that kind of insight and providing me specifically with uh, giving me that encouragement to just go forward and do something like that and put myself out there. I'm not really good with networking. It might not show, but I'm trying to hide the nerves. <laughs> but, you know, I'm a very shy person. I've always grown up just very introverted and reserved. And uh, I read that part about not putting labels onto yourself. And that was the first thing I thought, like for me, I wouldn't make a pose like I'm, I'm too shy for that. But that's just the label that I was given or that I adapted for myself or, um, you know, that my environment taught me. But seeing that, I was just able to say, you know, these are these are boxes that I put myself in. And it's just about time that I just get out of those boxes, put myself out there and, you know, just live, just be me and just enjoy the moment. So thank you again, Norm. Thank you, Nikan. And I'm really grateful that you put, first of all, I hadn't realized that Kindle, uh, that Kindle did that. And so I, I, I always read the hard copy. So now I'm, I think I might even try a Kindle version, um, but it's so wonderful for you to say that because I think the labels that we put on our own selves or that others have put on us that we've maybe taken away from uh, are always really important. I'm going to, I use this book oftentimes, or just even the, the Ted talk, Susan Cain's quiet. If you haven't seen her, uh, what is, how long is a TED Talk norm? Uh, 19 minutes, 18 minutes. Um, if you haven't seen her TED Talk about the power of quiet, the power of introverts, I would really highly recommend it to Kane because I think it's, it reminds any of us who might um, identify more as extroverts of the power of introverts and it reminds introverts of their own power. And I think it's a really exceptional yes book but if you only have 15 minutes at least that uh, that ted talk i don't know norm if you've seen susan kane's uh, uh book yeah i've, I've seen talk. the talk i read i read the book uh, she made it into i think she made it into breakdown so <laughs> oh, there we go oh really okay i hadn't realized <laughs> there we go i love it um i'm one of the things that you've talked about is uh is um uh meetings and respecting people's times it is 8 30 and so i do want to be respectful of people's times i want to end by just uh um before i thank you i want to end by a reminder that our next book club is with Deli Fromm's book, uh, Understanding uh, uh, Gender at Work, How to Use, Lose, and Expose Blind Spots for Career Success. That'll be March 28th. Many of you have already registered. If you haven't, feel free to register. Um, and I want to just thank Norm for this incredible conversation. Here's his contact information, his 
um, his website, my information if you ever want to continue the conversation. Uh, Norm, it's been an exceptional chance to A, read the book, B, have the conversation with you, and C, to engage with others about, um, uh, about career strategies and about our journey. So I really want to thank you for taking the time to share the book, write the book, share the book, and to, uh, talk to us uh, about it today. All right. Thank you for having me, and uh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone, and uh, see you in March, I hope. Take care. Bye now. Bye-bye.